Mi metto male, mamma mia, mamma di dare Figli mie, cutte dare, mamma mia, ben giaci tu Hey guys, welcome back. And as you can see in the title, today I'm talking about the new Panasonic Lumix GH7, which I'm super stoked about. I used to have the GH5 uh, myself back in the day. And as a Lumix ambassador, I was uh, fortunate enough to try this camera out. So what's new? And I mean, it's quite soon after the release, the GH6. So is there any upgrades you want to talk about? Is there any cool specs? And let me tell you, when I got my hands on this and when I tried it, it's like, as a filmmaker, you're like, oh, this is the perfect camera, this is... You always have that, and then like, oh, no, this is not the perfect camera. But the functions in this camera, it's just out of the world. Let's start with some specs. It's a 25.2 megapixel sensor with the new hybrid face autofocus. So it's the same autofocus system as in the G9, in the S5 Mark II, S5 Mark II X. So it's a super nice and easy autofocus to use. So you actually have a GH camera with functional autofocus system. I'm gonna show some clips here, as you can see how responsive it is to the face. And they've also developed this even more. So in the autofocus setting, you can track face, eye, animal, you can track cars, and then you can choose if you want the side of the car, or if you want the front of the car, as you can see on the video here. You also have plane and train and motorcycle. And you can choose what kind of part you want. On a motorcycle, you can choose if you want the rider's helmet or if you want the full kind of kind of deal. So that's really cool that they actually figure out how to put this into the GH series. I'm gonna start unboxing it. So in the box, of course, it comes with manuals, that's the standard. And immediately when you lift it up, you we can move this here maybe. No, we'll put that one down there for now. So here you have the camera. It's, I mean, if you, if you shot Lumix GH series before, you're gonna recognize it. Super nice, super sleek. One new addition that I noticed from when I used the GH5 is the uh, this button, it's an info button. I kind of pushed that one sometimes and thought I was pressing record, but I think it's just a matter of getting used to. You have the same kind of dial on top as you always had that you can lock and unlock. So that's uh, super nice and easy. Also one thing that you had in the GH6, which you also have in this, it's a tilt and a swivel. Let's see if I can get a good, yeah, I think I can get a good hit. So you can tilt it out and you can also have it, you know, fully out. And this also makes sure that you don't hit um, any of the ports here when using an HDMI cable or recording straight in SSD. Uh, yeah, you can still record to an SSD. So you can put a two terabyte SSD in and then just, you know, go at it. So you have a good workflow when it comes to recording and then put it into the computer. You can even edit off your SSD disk. So it's super easy. What more? Yeah, now I've just, you know, said some of the cool things, but trust me, I'm, I'm not even halfway. Uh, one thing that Lumix, or Lumix, one thing that Panasonic actually is including with this camera, it's this. It's BNC, so you can actually put time code in straight out of the box when you get it. So it's a BNC to their adapter, which is super handy if you're using, let's say, the um, Rode Wireless Pro or anything else that you actually have time code and want to put it into, into your camera without having to jeopardize the audio with putting in, you know, the uh, 3.5 that goes, well, yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, so camera-wise, it feels like you used to. It's still a micro four thirds sensor. One thing though, that is insanely cool with this, and I can't say that enough. This little camera records ProRes RAW HQ internal. That's just, I was so shocked. It records, of course, ProRes 422, ProRes HQ. It records ProRes RAW 5.8K internal. Just, you know, kind of wrap your head around that. Before we always had to get it out to the Atomos uh, Ninja or Shogun to do an external recording of the RAW, but now you can actually do it inside here and at the same time record proxies. This camera has something that I wish that my S52X has. It has one CF Express Type B slot and then it has one regular SD card slot, which means you can record super fast and you can record, you know, 
at bigger file sizes and with bigger file sizes also more quality. I think that's one of the reasons where you can record raw internal with this because you have a faster memory card to write to. So that's one thing that I find amazing with this one. Yeah, and if you go to, you know, all the regular codecs, you have Vlog, you have real-time LUT, which you can use with the Lumix app. I haven't used Lumix app yet because it just got out and for um, Android and I have an iOS device. So I haven't tested that one yet. I'm going to get into that more when they release it for the iOS because I have the uh, Lumix S9 camera that I'm trying out as well. That's one thing that you can develop your own LUTs in the app and then just ship them to the camera. It's super fast, super easy from what I've seen other creators that probably have like a pre-release of that app. And when it comes to, to frame rates and things like that, so when you shoot ProRes RAW HQ and ProRes RAW in 5.7K, you can record 23.7 frames per second, 25 or 24, depending on what frequency you're on. But when you shoot the regular ProRes RAW uh, Cinema 4K, you can shoot up to 60 frames per second. So you actually can shoot ProRes RAW in slow motion internally, which is just phew. And when it comes to the regular codecs, the MOV MP4 that you have in the camera, you have a lot of flavors to play with when you're doing the, uh, the frame rates. In open gate, you can still shoot 30, 25, and 24 in 420 10-bit. So that's still if you want to shoot in open gate. If you shoot in cinema 4K resolution, then you can shoot it up to 60 frames per second in 422 10-bit. But if you drop to 420 10-bit color, you can actually get 120 frames per second in cinema 4K. And if you drop down to 4K, you have the same kind of codex. You have up to 60 frames per second in 4K, 422 10 bit, and up to 120 frames if you go 420 10 bit. So it's still a lot of information and a lot of files. As you can see here in the little fire video, this is shot in 100 frames per second. And I just love the, the color rendition that the Lumix actually gives out. It's insane the quality that you get. Okay, but if you drop down to full HD, you can still have 240 frames per second in 422 10 bit. That's just an insane amount of information that you still can work with in a 1080, 1080p workflow and you can still upscale it if you use DaVinci or something like that because slow motion is usually you know how it is okay record limits cooling does it overheat well they put in here behind the uh, monitor they have a, an active cooling fan and they also removed all limits of recording so you have no recording limits you can record how long as you want and if you record to an external SSD I mean, they can record until the SSD is full in two terabytes. That's a lot of memory to fill. Yeah. One cool thing that you have with this, you can still record in cinema 4K, 50, 60 frames per second, and still output over HDMI. So you can, you know, record via HDMI as well. So if you record cinema 4K, put it to an external monitor, recording it there, and then also record it as a proxy, you actually have three different files to work with. I don't know why you would want it, but if you're super scared that your footage will get lost, yeah, of course, that's the solution. Okay, so I left one thing out, and this is one of the coolest features for me. So it's the DMW XLR2. It's the XLR adapter for the uh, DH7. And what they've done is they've also included a microphone adapter that you can put on. So you can have your microphone just set like this. They also have the little locking mechanism here. So you just put it on. And lock it and you still have a cold shoe on top if you want to have some accessories there so there's been another XLR adapter so what's cool with this well this one actually is doing something that's the world's first as far as I know and that's if you have this on you actually get 32-bit float internal on the camera so when you put this on you have a 32-bit float that goes into the camera and the camera records it so when you put it into your NLE, you actually have a 32-bit float file that you don't have to pair with timecode or anything. And that's the first, and that's insane, especially if you're in environments with a lot of sounds or no sounds. We've been talking about that here on the channel before. So that's just an insane feature that's really helpful for all of us creators. Okay, so what are my thoughts on this camera? Because so obviously I've had it for, for a few days now to, to try it out. It's really solid. The image stabilization is insane. All the shots that you've seen here, they are all shot handheld. No gimbal, no nothing, but it's still so easy to use. Autofocus is solid. I mean, car autofocus works, human autofocus works, just regular autofocus when filming the little pizza thing that I showed earlier, and also the car 
um, the car out of focus that I showed. It's super stable. Uh, of course, this is a pre-production model, so there's always a few kinks that I need to, like that needs to be worked out, but there was nothing that really hindered my, my workflow. If we look at things that you might need to think about when going for this camera. So this is micro four third sensor, which means that that sensor compared to that sensor, it's quite a big difference. So what are the things that you need to think about when going for micro four third sensor? Since the sensor is so much smaller, it also gets less lighting, which means that you need more light in order to have this working properly. It doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. It's just something to have in mind when you go into low light situations. You have to shoot a lot in low light. Think about that. One other thing with Micro Four Thirds is there's a lot of secondhand lenses and there's a lot of lenses that are very cheap because the sensor is small, which means less glass, which means that the lenses is quite affordable. So it, it goes both ways. Um, but yeah, l like I said, when I had my hands on this, I think this is an amazing camera. I would definitely, you know, want to play some more with this. I need to send it back uh, to Panasonic because I was lucky enough to, to be the first one to use it. But like all in all, this camera, it's super versatile. It's super small. It's super lightweight. Micro Four Thirds camera says, you know, fits in my palm. So even smaller than my tripod head, which is, you know, so perfect for you know beginning filmmakers the price on this camera is going to land somewhere around 2200 euros and the uh, xlr adapter is going to be somewhere around 450 500 euros when the prices are set so this is definitely an affordable uh, solution if you want to get professional video in a very small little uh, package i'm definitely going to use this more and as i said 32 bit float internal prores raw internal prores internal 120 frames per second i mean all these features, and one good thing with this, that's been a gripe with some of the other cameras that I've used, I assume, there's no crop when going to higher frame rates. So, 100 frames per second, it's got the same crop as 25 frames per second. So it's super easy, you don't need to switch lenses, you don't need to take cropping into account. So, definitely check this camera out. And yeah, thanks for looking. Yeah, just, you know, take a good, nice look at it. Also me, because I'm sending it back. Yeah, cool. Thanks, guys.